And this right. is a chapter which is a lot of very practical stuff. We were talking last week about the process of becoming not just in tune, but connected to sort of wake up the das. We mentioned that the, the relationship of our soul, the expression of our soul, has its top is Chachma, Bina, and Das. Chachma is that spark, that conception, that initial idea. Bina is the development, the comprehension of an idea. And Das is the application relating to the idea. As we mentioned that it says, and whenever the Torah wants to talk about the relationship between Adam and Eve or other relationships in the Torah, it says, and Adam knew Eve. Adam yoda Das is Chava. Das is the idea of connecting. In other words, you can have something which you know, but it doesn't change you, it doesn't affect you. And then you can have something which das means, I, not just I know it, I'm connected to it, it affects me. Information that doesn't just, just uh, go around in my head, and something I think about, like the uh, effects of maybe a fattening food or the value of exercise, but actually gets me to take action. Meaning I absorb it, I connect with it, and it changes me, it affects me. And that's what we're trying to do here. So we mentioned the beginning of the chapter that there are a few ways or processes how a Jew can come to Das. The first way is, and that's, by the way, how you come to fear God. Because everyone has a fear of God on some level, and we know it because of God forbid in the emergency, we're all aware of God. But how do we bring it and have it there and, and uh, connect? So the first thing we said is the Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe Rabbeinu wakes up or shines within us a level of Das which is a fear of God in a personal, meaningful way. Then we said that every leader, and every Rebbe, every leader of a generation, is that generation's Moshe, as the Zohar says, the Ispashtus of the Moshe, the extension of Moshe Rabbeinu in that generation. He fires up, wakes up, and encourages, and uh, sort of brings to the surface your Das. But that's not enough. The Alter Rebbe continued and said that we have to have, the most important part is our effort. And when he says in our effort, he mentions that there are two parts of this process. One is removing that which covers the das, or the fear of God. And the second one is waking up and inspiring that das, that fear of God itself. In other words, a Jew has within himself two drives. What are we? What are, what's our identity? Who are we? What's the identity of every one of us, of each, of each and every one of us is our true self? And the answer really is the true identity we have is called the thinking self. In the Tanya, it's only mentioned once or twice in the entire Tanya, it's called nefesh hasichlis, the thinking self. That thinking self that makes the decisions in life, in the words of our, one of our past presidents, George W. Bush, he says, I am the decider. Meaning, who is the decider when you have a decision being suggested from one direction? And a decision being suggested from another direction, who decides? That's you, the thinking soul. But the thinking soul is challenged with two drives, two pulls, or two pushes, or like a, a guy is stuck and a tow truck is pulling. So what's if a tow truck is pulling from the other side? You have two forces pulling or pushing our, our character, our self, our behavior, or to be practical, our thought, our speech, and our action. One is called the godly soul, the never shall kiss, uh, one is called the animal soul, the Nefesh Bahamas. And these are the two drives that we have. What we're going to talk here now, we're going to say the first thing you have to do, we said, was to break, to, to remove, to get rid of, to destroy. It means the Nefesh Bahamas as an impediment to our service of God. Because we have to understand, God installed within us two drives, not just to challenge us, which is part of it, but also because the Nefesh Bahamas has a very important purpose. We can't interact with the world with the nefesh of the kiss itself. If all we okay, so as we were saying, that the animal soul has a drive that's trying to pull you in a certain direction. But the truth is the animal soul has a purpose. The purpose of the animal soul is to give you the interface with the world. In other words, the animal soul has an opportunity or a possibility to be a tool a conduit for the godly soul to connect to the world because the only animal soul wants to make sure you're in shape and that you brush your teeth and that you're healthy, etc. And 
just one more thing here on to make <clears throat> she, I can't hear you and I just there's a standard picture. There you go. <laughs> okay. I'm just trying to get myself here. Okay. All right. Now we got it. Okay. So basically, again, I'm sorry for some of the technical difficulties, but that's a sign that what we're doing is important. When it's not working easy, it's a good sign. It means something important is going to happen. Okay. So the animal soul, our, our goal is to make sure the animal soul is an impediment, but it's actually doing its role in serving a uh, godly soul as a, a debtor to the world, as an interface to the world. The problem is, oftentimes, we're living in a material world, we get caught up with the world, and we forget about the purpose. So we get caught up with eating a good uh, meal, uh, worrying about our ego, worrying about our self-importance, worrying about our, our uh, happiness, our, our pleasures, our, our frustrations, our emotions. So what we have to do really is to make an effort not to let the animal soul be an impediment only a, a, a conduit, a vessel to serve God. So the first meditation that we had, we mentioned last week, was to destroy, to break the coarseness, let's call it the ego that the animal soul gives us, which doesn't allow us to see anything besides ourselves. And every event that we encounter, it's how it affects us versus the value, the importance, the purpose of that experience. So last week's meditation was focused on removing the impediment, removing the animal soul's coarse ego that covers over the true identity that we have. The metaphor we gave was a person that wants to uncover from the ground. We know the Baal Shem Tov says that the Jewish people, are, uh, he explained what it means, Eretz Chefetz, we're a land of desire. It means that we have, just like all the earth, wherever you go, has underneath tremendous resources whether it's gold, whether it's coal, whether it's oil, whether it's water, there's resources. All you have to do is dig to find it. We have to allow to, or we have to make an effort to remove the dirt, the coarse sand, the rocks that cover over our identity, our true self, the real us, the real I. And that real I is the party that wants to be a true servant of God or a true selfless neshama serving Hashem in any way as needed. The second part we're going to talk about today is the other meditation. That's what we're going to focus on today. The other meditation is not to sort of break the animal soul or refine the animal soul, because you don't want to break it as much as you want to transform it from being an impediment to being a vessel, to being a conduit, because the animal soul is needed. Now we're going to talk about remove the dirt, remove the soil, remove all that which covers over the true you, your fear of God, your love of God, your connection to God, now we got to bring it to the surface. So in this, we have to make a sort of a small introduction and explain a very interesting difference in two types of, two general types of meditation. When one is meditating, there are two, there's more than two, but two types of meditation and to understand the difference. One is called a Bina meditation and one is called a Das meditation. As we mentioned before, the cognitive or the intellectual capacity of the soul is divided into three categories, Chachma, Bina, Das. Chachma doesn't always have your ability to meditate on it for a simple reason. Chachma is a flash. Chachma sometimes comes to your soul without you knowing why. An idea pops into your head. Where did it come from? I'm not sure. Sometimes it's because you thought about the subject for a long time, so you stimulated something deep in your soul. We say your soul, I mean the intellectual part of your soul. And sometimes it's a gift from God. God sends you a flash of light. But that is not an area where you meditate because that's a flash. The meditation happens in Bina. For an example, let's say you walk into a house in a pitch black home. And whether you're hiking in the woods, whether you come into a home that you're renting and you've never been there before, and the power doesn't work. There's a thunderstorm. And you're standing inside. And suddenly there's a flash of lightning that every window lets in light that lights up the entire house for a split second. That is Chachma. Bina now is, one second, let me try and think what I just saw. I think to the right, I saw a staircase. Ahead of me, there was a sink. To the left, there was a chair. Meaning, now you can start comprehending what you saw in that flash. 
develop it. But during that flash, that's all there is. So Bina is the meditation process to develop an idea. It could be also an idea that pops into your head, a solution. Someone gives you a complicated puzzle or a math problem and you're trying to solve it. And suddenly it pops into your head, the solution. And you say, I got it. And someone says, what is it? You go, shh, but I thought you have it. Now we got to develop it. I got I to gotta bring it out and it's, I got to formulate it. Or as you were, the word we say is, it's got to be comprehended. No difference than the role of a woman in the production of a child where the initial idea, so to speak, the spark, the seed comes from the husband, but it's the woman who has to develop that into a child with arms and legs and a head and, and intestines and blood and skin and bones and all that. That happens in the process. A man, his role is called Chachma. A woman is called Bina. And so Bina means developing and meditating an intellectual idea, taking it from a kernel and developing it. That is Bina to, and the purpose of that uh, um, meditation is to properly understand an idea. I want to understand it, and there's a meditation to get to there. Another type of meditation is not to understand something, but to feel something, to absorb it, to let that information affect you. That is more, of, as we'll see, we'll see soon, some differences. That is a very different meditation, and it's different because the end result is something different. The end result is not to understand something, it's to feel something. So I want to share three, four, or five differences when you're meditating from a Bina perspective because you want to understand it, and you're meditating from a Das perspective because you want to feel or absorb it, and it's very different. The first difference is, is how long or until when do you meditate? So for an example, if the meditation you're trying to get to is that two plus two equal four, that's a pretty easy one. You only have to meditate long enough until you figure out that two plus two is four. If it's a young child, he might take two you know, pieces of crayon and two more pieces of crayon, and he gets to realize it's four. If you have a more complicated problem you wanna figure out, you'd meditate a little longer, but once you come to the solution or you achieve your goal, you're done. You stop thinking. We have a, a, not a joke, but a famous line. We say, why do you always find something in the last place that you look? Why do you look there first? Because once you find it, obviously you stop thinking. A meditation to understand something, a thinking to understand them here, you don't have to continue thinking about it once you figure it out. <laughs> There's no point in still, you have tried to figure out a word in a crossword puzzle. And you can't get it, you get it. You don't have to say, okay, let me still think about it. For, you're done, you figured it out. A meditation to affect you, even after you understand it, you think about it longer and longer. Because the more you think about it, the more it's going to affect you. Think about, for an example, why something that someone very nice did to your grandparents when they were in Russia or in Poland or during the war, or as someone took care of your family when they came to this country, or someone helped you out in a time of need. The longer you think about it, not just to know, yeah, okay, I got it. They helped me out. No, think about it. The more you think about it, the more you're going to feel that love. And unfortunately, it's easier to understand this from the other direction. Someone who hurt your feelings, someone who offended you. The more you think about it, the more upset you're going to get, the more angry you're going to get, the more you're going to have a feeling of negative, uh, you know, feelings to them. Because as you think further and further, the effect on you is much more profound. So the first difference is the length of how long you have to think about something. The second difference is the frequency. What does that mean? When you want to understand something, once you figure out something, you don't have to think about it a second time. I got it. I mean, maybe a, you know, a year later, you forgot the puzzle, so you try and do it again. But the next day, there's no need to think about the same riddle again. Let me, let me try and understand that riddle. You got it. You have the answer. So if your meditation was there to understand something, you don't have to do the same meditation twice. You did it. It's done. Move on. You figured out the problem, you have the solution, no need to think about it again. As a matter of fact, if you try and think about it the second time, it takes a second because I got it. I have the answer. The answer is, you know, 26 or 42. So the bottom line is, that is uh, when it comes to understanding a Bina meditation, but a Das meditation, you can think about it every single day and it's purposeful and meaningful, it's not a waste of time. So for an example, if you, or want to think about the relationship that your mother has to you, or someone, uh, in this case, talking about God, the effect, 
the more you think about it and the more frequent you think about it, it benefits you. It's a great thing to take time every single morning and think about the dedication of your parents to you, your children to you, your spouse to you, your, your whatever you want to have a feeling to. And every single day, it's not a waste of time. On the contrary, it's a needed meditation. Unlike a puzzle that you have to figure out intellectually, one time there's no need to meditate a second time. It's done. In feelings, if you want to be affected by it, think about this every single morning. And as I mentioned before, think about the converse. If you think about something negative, somebody will hurt you. If you think about it a lot, the resentment builds up more and more and more. It's very unhealthy. I mean, sometimes it's healthy to think about the negative effects of someone who has a problem with alcohol or something. You should think every day how bad it is for you because it will affect you not to touch it. But in other words, when you want to be affected by a thought, the more frequent you do it, the better. That's the second difference. A third difference is how you meditate. What does it mean? Are you meditating because you want to understand something? So for an example, let's say you're watching a video of an event. One way to watch the video is you're looking at the details, understanding what happened. And therefore, when you're watching the video, um, you're looking at the details and you're analyzing the events that took place. But if let's say you're watching the video of your wedding over by mitzvah, you're not looking at the details to analyze it. I mean, you might one time do that too. I want to see who came to the wedding. I want to see the style of clothes they wore, you know, back in 1980s or 70s or 60s or 90s or whatever year we got married. You might be looking at it, but if you're looking at it to reflect, it's a feeling you're trying to get. You're not trying to analyze it. You're just watching the video. It doesn't matter the details. You're just getting a feeling. You're getting a sense of, man, I remember that. What part? Just, you know, just watching it. It's just cool. It's just amazing. Meaning the meditation, the reflecting on something is not the details. They're trying to understand it. You're not analyzing the information. You're just a general sense that the event gives you. An example would be if someone got to a bit has a relative that passed away who they loved and they're watching either a class that that relative gave or they're watching an event that that relative is um, at. Sometimes you're not even paying attention to the details, just reflecting on the memory of that time. Whereas if you were trying to analyze it, the, the, um, a good example is watch videos of the Rebbe. Sometimes you watch a video of the Rebbe, you're trying to learn a talk that the Rebbe gave on a certain event and you're trying to listen to the details of the talk he gave. Sometimes you're watching a Fabrengen, it doesn't matter really to you right now what the Rebbe is saying. It's a feeling watching the event, the interaction. It's, you're being affected, not by the details that's being analyzed, but you're being affected by the experience, the general experience. Um, a great idea would be the difference between someone looking at a painting because they're a art teacher and they're analyzing the strokes and the way the painting is made and the colors that were used and the highlights and the message you wanted that. And some people just love looking at a painting and absorbing the beauty. I'm not looking at the painting to analyze it. I'm looking at the painting to absorb it. That's a different, um, uh, Bina meditation is analysis. I want to understand what's the painter thinking when he made this painting? What was going through his mind? Why was he using these darker colors? Why did he use an oil paint? Why did he use such sharp strokes? Why was it more abstract? In other words, I'm analyzing the painting. And then that's a different type of experience. But if you want to just absorb the painting and be mesmerized by the beauty or the video or any other experience in life, that is called a das meditation. This is three major differences, but there's one more bigger one, which is probably the most important difference of a Bina meditation versus a Das meditation. And this one is so phenomenal. It's, it's a foundation perspective on any meditation we're gonna do. And that is, is the thought that you're thinking about meant to be objectively thought about or subjectively thought about? What does that mean? Let's say I'm trying to decide about a certain event, a trip I wanna do. I don't wanna get into the politics, but politics is a great example of this. Uh, but any event, if you wanna truly analyze it, you have to be completely objective. If there's a court case going on, and the court case includes relatives or friends of mine, I'm going to probably take the side of the defense or the prosecution, whichever one my friend is on. In other words, when you're, when you're subjective, you can't help but be blinded by the subject. In this week's parasha, we learn about the, um, 
I don't mean blinded by the subject, blinded to be honest on the subject. Uh, this week's portion, we're learning about bribery. That bribery is called sheikhad. Where does the word sheikhad come from? Sheikhad to bribe somebody. Sheikhad comes from the word shahu chad. You become one. You're, you're, you're no longer objective. You're subjective. You're now related to the subject. Shahu chad, you're one with the subject. You can't be honest with something. One of the reasons why it's good to have a life coach or a consultant or someone who guides you, helps make decisions, to have somebody that's not you. You're, when you're involved in something, you can't think honestly. You just, it's a fact. It's nothing offensive to a person. In general, you'll find, the, let's just take the example of politics for an example. Nine out of ten times, you will agree and defend your own political um, candidate and be critical and oppose uh, the views of the other candidate. But between me and you, if no one told you this, but the candidate switched views, you would suddenly defend his position. Why? Because first I'm loyal to the person. Then I'm, I'm, I'm justifying in my mind why he's right. In other words, when you want to be intellectually honest, you have to be completely detached from the subject. So a true and honest uh, meditation to understand right and wrong and ethics and morals and when it comes to mathematics and science, usually it's not so much, mathematics certainly is not so much an emotional connection. Science today, unfortunately, we see how it gets mixed in to personal opinions on life. But whenever you have self involved, you can't have an honest intellectual meditation. On the other hand, when you have something that the purpose of the meditation is das to affect you, you can't be disconnected. That's a dangerous thing to do. To be emotionally detached is not healthy in the, in the, when it's needed. When you want to think about how much a person loves you and how much you should be affected by a certain thing, either to love or to be afraid of or to be attracted to, you must be subjective. Otherwise, you won't be affected by the subject. You'll be disconnected. It's a dangerous psychological place to be when you can't be emotionally affected by an experience. So meditation and das requires you and the subject to become one. Otherwise, it won't affect you. Why is it important to know all these things? Because after, sometimes when we talk about meditation, we could, in our mind, not realize just two different general categories. And when we come to a subject here, we want to be affected by thinking about God. We have to recognize the four key elements of this meditation. Number one, it has to be something that we think about even after we understand. You say, oh, you can't say, oh, I know this one already. No, think about it the second time and a third time and a fourth time and a fifth time. As he says, every single day, we mentioned last week, the previous Rebbe said in a talk in 1932, that you should think about this uh, meditation of your relationship with God and your purpose and trying to remove your ego. It should be every day, seven days a week, 30 days a month, month, 365 a year for 10 or 15 years, and maybe it'll be affected because it takes tremendous time to refine oneself in your character. The second thing is, besides the frequency and the length of time you spend, even after you have to understand it, make sure you're also reflecting on the concept, the idea, not just being caught up with the details. Oftentimes, if we're caught up with the details, we can't see the picture. As a famous expression goes, you can't see the forest because of the trees. What does that mean you can't see the forest because of the trees? It means the trees are blocking my view of the rest of the forest. All I see is a tree which sometimes that's good. In order to see the tree, sometimes you have to lift yourself up a little higher, to see the forest, I mean, to lift up and go in a helicopter, meaning get, absorb the entire experience. You, you have to sort of have, find a way to absorb the entire painting. Don't just look at one corner, one piece of it. It's the experience as a whole that affects you. It's a phenomenal thing. People who produce movies who are professional and they write a book, they make sure that every single part that's into the editor, they, they, they film, they video, maybe dozens or hundreds of hours of video. And they take the time and based on their th thoughts, what will create a feeling of fear, of humor, of uh, drama, of horror, of uh, excitement in the, in, the, in the person viewing this video? In other words, there's a, a, a holistic experience that comes out of this meditation. And that's the, 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 the third and a, a very important component. But the final one is that we think about Hashem or godliness, an idea, Hasidic thought, it has to be subject, it has to be personal. It has to relate to us, it has to matter. It has to be something that affects us. In other words, the way to be successful in meditation, to be transformed, to truly wake up this love of God, but more importantly, our awe, our respect, 
our recognition of godliness and its, its, its impact on us to make it real requires these four. And if someone doesn't do it, as the expression goes, if someone tells you, I tried, it didn't work. Don't believe him. What does that mean? It works, but it takes a lot of effort. No different than mastering the skill of playing the piano or playing a violin or learning any type of dance or learning any type of skill. You have within you, certain people have within themselves certain skills. Yitzhak Perlman didn't wake up in the morning and play. He may have come much faster and farther than other people because he has a different soul. He has a soul connected to music. So he can advance much further than we can advance. You know, Yugaito Matsasa doesn't mean that every single person can do anything you want. Not every person could be everything. But when it comes to fearing God, every single person can get there. You can't say every person, you could be the world's greatest artist. Maybe yeah, maybe no. Depends on your soul. Depends on what type of personality you have. Depends on your characteristics. You can't be the greatest surgeon. You can't necessarily be the greatest, uh, you know, a musician or dancer. Everybody, ha- or thinker. Some are more intellectually gifted, some are not. But every single person has bequeathed to them and has inside of them this natural fear of God. And that's what Moshe Rabbeinu told the Jewish people we see at the beginning of this chapter. When, he's, when he says to them, what does God want from you? Just that you should fear him. Just fear God. And we said in the Talmud, is fearing God so easy? And the answer was yes, for Moshe it's easy. So the question was, and Moshe wasn't talking to himself. He was talking to the people. And that's what the Alter Rebbe explains. Each one of us has some Moshe inside of us. In other words, we all have inside of us this Moshe. And this could be awakened, but it has to come through a desire and an effort and a work. It doesn't come naturally unless in a crisis. In a crisis, it comes out naturally. Just like in a crisis, Every parent puts aside all the distractions and runs to the child. You throw your laptop and your job, everything away. But when it's not a crisis, if you meditate about the impact of you being distracted from your children by your computer, by your laptop, or by your job, it won't affect you to change how you interact with them. In other words, it takes a tremendous amount of effort to get to this place. And this is one of the things that God told Moshe Rabbeinu when he said, I appeared to Avram and to Yitzchak and to Yaakov. I appeared to the forefathers. Rashi comments, Ha'avais, the forefathers. So the question is, we're talking about the forefathers. Why is Rashi telling us it's referring to the Avais? So Hasidus explains, Rashi is saying Avais could be understood from another uh, uh, root word. Not fathers, but desire, yearning. God appears to those who yearn for God. Meaning, God appears to those who are desiring and tremendously yearning to connect to him. You want to have a relationship with God. You work your hardest you can. Meditate. Try. It's, in, it's, it's within you. It's inside of you. But it takes effort to bring it to the surface. And that's the metaphor of the two parts that are needed in order to bring to the surface the resources in the ground, whether it's coal, whether it's water, whether it's oil. They're all down there, depending where you dig what's down there but you need to remove that which blocks it. That means the coarseness, the ego of the animal soul and let it become better a vessel that your job and your exercise and your coffee should not be impediments to godliness. They should help you serve God. And at the same time, you have to have the effort to inspire, to wake up this natural fear of God that's within you. That's Zalman in the background, um, if you hear him uh, making some choices about his breakfast menu. Um, in any case, to conclude for today, I'm just going to read inside a few lines because um, we mainly spoke outside. I'm just going to go through the bottom half of page 118 briefly because we're going to tomorrow continue from the top of page Samach. Vashenis, and the second meditation, the second type of meditation that's required is waking up the soul, meaning not just to remove the dirt that's blocking, not just to get the, the animal soul out of the way, but the godly soul to be inspired. And this comes through deep, long, and profound meditation for a long time. Again, it's not talking about a bina meditation, but a das. Kishir zu nefesh. How long is different for every single person? Hashem, 
There are some people that are very, very naturally spiritually in tune. And just a few moments of thinking about God and you, you fanned up the flame. It's no different, by the way, than emotionally. Some people are very easy to get angry. You can fan their anger up, their passions is just beneath the surface, and whammo, you say two words and they're off their top. Some people, they'll flip the lid. Some people are colder by nature. It takes a lot to get them worked up. You hardly ever see them emotional. You hardly ever see them frazzled. But you can get there. Do it long enough. Guaranteed, you will get them stirred. Same thing is with our feelings to Hashem. Some people, just the way we were designed by our character, by the effects of our parents when they were um, creating us, so to speak, the effects of where our soul's journey came down to this world, the effect of how many times we indulge in our personal self-serving desires versus working on ourselves to be a little bit less consumed with our personal needs and our personal desires. It's all the nature, the nurture, the spiritual origin, the experience, past. All these are factors in how long it takes to be stimulated to suddenly feel godliness. But they're different than every single person. Some people right away, like it says in the Code of Jewish Law, that some people, when they just think for a moment about when a person thinks about the great, powerful king, God, the king of the universe, that his presence and glory fills the entire world, just think for a moment, Hashem is standing are watching over you, no different than a parent watching over the child sitting by the table doing his homework. And you think, God is watching me. For some people, immediately they're, they're, they're all caught up with that idea and they're in tune and they act with the right ethics and morals and values and spiritual appropriate behavior because some people are very quickly stimulated by a spiritual encouragement or a meditation. And there are others, Vyesh, Shishfei Some people are naturally more coarse and more low. Vitaldasa, whether it's because of nature, whether because of nurture. Where the soul was carved out of from under the great chair of God. There's all different places the soul can come from and all different journey processes the soul has coming down to this world. And some souls are not naturally, it's no criticism. Some souls just don't get inspired too easy. And they can't really meditate or feel godliness in their, in their spiritual, you know, um, in, intellectually, but spiritual stimulation, unless with great, great effort, and it doesn't always work, and it's not so easy. And he says it doesn't come easy. And it takes a lot of effort, tremendous effort. Sometimes you see some kids do math problems and homework, and blip, they get right through it. And some kids, you don't know if they're pretending or they're real, they just don't get what you're saying. And you have to have patience and realize kids' minds work differently. And they think differently. And they absorb information differently. And they analyze differently. And the same thing is spiritually. Especially, especially if you've done in your lifetime severe sins. There are all different types of sins. Some sins cause a much greater coarseness and desensitizes the soul. If you've done those sins in your lifetime, then certainly you'll have a harder time no different than someone who's trying to run a marathon and wasn't being careful at all with their physical fitness. They never pl- go outside and do any cardio or run around. So how do you, what do you expect? You, you've you've uh, neglected your spiritual growth. If God forbid you've done that, it's even harder to be in tune to a spiritual, refined idea. But nevertheless, whichever group you're in, if with great effort and with great um, determination, you sit and you work, you'll figure out that math problem, so to speak, you will be able to connect and feel spiritually. It's true, it's a lot of effort. And a great depth, a great amount of, you know, working on yourself. To spend a lot of time. And a lot of time means you build up bit by bit by bit by bit. You can't go from zero to 120 in a second. You have to build up on what is God and what am I and what is creation. And this is really what the process of, if you look at davening, one day we'll have a class on davening. You'll, the davening really is this process of building up till we get to the Amida. It talks about submission. It talks about uh, God's greatness in creating the world. It talks about the, the plants, the fields, the animals, the angels, people going out of Egypt. 
getting ourselves more and more spiritually turned on to God's graciousness to us, His holiness. And then we can say the Shema. And after that, the Amida. In other words, it's a buildup. That's, that's, Davani really is one giant meditation to be affected by the feelings that will make you approach the Shema and the Amida with the right uh, heart, you know, being stirred and woken up. So Bavadai, the guarantee is if you do it, every single person could do it. Not every person could be a scientist that solves the illnesses of the world. Not every person could be the greatest musician, though if you have it in you and you don't try, it's not going to come out. You got to work on it. You got to develop it. But every single person could be God-fearing because that's something you were pre-installed inside of you. No difference than you have it underground or inside of you. The difference is, are you convinced that it's there? If you're not convinced that it's there, you're never going to really dedicate yourself to it. So the first thing you have to have is the knowledge that it's actually there. And that's really important. It's like if someone told you, under your house, there might be a box of jewels worth $100 million. There might be it. Uh, how hard are you going to work to find it? You may be able to take a shovel, dig around a little bit. You're not going to tear down your house looking for it. But if you know 100% sure, however that would be theoretically, that there's $100 million worth of jewels in a box underneath your house, underneath the ground, you are not going to stop digging and digging and searching. You'll be up at night, you'll be up in the morning. Why? Because you know it's there and you'll spare no effort to get there. We have to recognize and know we do have inside of us that Moshe Rabbeinu. We do have inside of us that, that, that Das. And the way we search for it, we'll see in one second. King Solomon tells us how to search for it. Let's see this inside. He says, maybe you won't reach Yeratata, the highest level of fear, which we didn't discuss yet. But you will certainly re- reach the level of awe that we spoke in chapter 41. The, tr- the basic, true level of awe of God. Like I say, just tell if you make effort and you succeed, you shall be believed because hard effort will bring success, certainly in this area. As King Solomon says his wisdom, you will search for it like silver or gold that's under the ground and like a treasure you will search. So if a person takes that approach and doesn't give up and knows I know that I have to get in shape spiritually. I know it takes a lot of exercise spiritually. I know I will do it. If you work on it, you're guaranteed to come to that place. But it does take a lot of work, hours, years. It's not something that comes easily. You could say, you know, I tried to do it. It didn't work. It's a guarantee. There's certain things, we, I'll conclude with this. There are certain things we said in life are guaranteed to affect the person. We are guaranteed that money makes you odd. That's what it says. Money makes you act and do odd things. And alcohol, scotch and whiskey will get you drunk. And the study of godliness, Hasidus, will refine your character. And if someone says, I, I, I have money, I didn't become weird. You don't have enough. Go to Malibu. You'll see a lot of people, a lot of money, and start doing weird things, buying the weirdest art. going through. You have enough money, you start doing weird things. Some people, it's not enough to have a billion. They're not going to be weird yet. They have two billions. It's not enough. But at some point, it's going to affect you. Drinking, some people say, I don't get drunk. Drink some more. I mean, not real advice. I'm saying the concept. Because eventually, alcohol makes a person drunk. And this, these meditations, the study of Hasidic understanding of godliness, will refine you to the point that it affects you and changes you. And if it's done in a healthy way, in a proper way, with the right, not getting into some weird Kabbalah, as you see a lot of times, maybe advertised in Kabbalah studies. We're talking about a Hasidic insight into God, into your soul, understanding your nature, understanding where you come from, what our purpose is, what our mission is, how God interacts with us. And we think about it enough, it will transform us, and then our awe of God will be real. What, is awe, what does real mean? One thing. It's the feeling, just like you have a feeling of someone else in the room. We're not talking about awareness of God, that you understand the essence of God, how he creates. We're talking about that it becomes real to you. As real as, as Yochanan and Zachary said on his deathbed, we had this a few months ago, that you'll feel him as much as someone else is in a room. You will feel the presence of God for real. That is the difference between believing in God and knowing God. Knowing God means I actually feel like he's here. I don't know how he looks, but I, I am careful in my conduct as if someone else was in the room. And to get to that point requires a lot of effort. And every single person can get there just some have an easier time and some have a harder time. 
We'll conclude here.